Hi everyone, this is Editing Jen. I forgot to say this when I was filming earlier, so I'm just slotting this clip in. I just wanted to mention for anyone who's interested, I'm doing Vlogmas over on Patreon again this year. Patreon is a place where you can tip your favorite creators. So the support on there allows me to spend more time creating free content for everybody on YouTube. And Vlogmas is where you upload a video every day on the run up to Christmas. So from the 1st of December till the 24th of December. So if you fancy coming over and joining us for Vlogmas, it costs $2 for the whole month. Um, I am, as I said, uploading a video every day over on Patreon, but they're not the kind of videos that I would make and upload on YouTube. They're completely different in the sense that they're really just very relaxed and, and chilled out. I am filming on my webcam uh, in one take each day um, speaking about a topic that you've asked me to talk about or answering a question. So if you would like to come and hang out, that would be lovely. I'll leave a link down below. If you don't fancy it, don't worry. All of my usual content that I put on YouTube is still going out, so you're not missing out on any of the usual content that I will be putting up. I have another cookery video coming up this month. I have a video on the history of Little Red Riding Hood, along with lots of other bookish videos too. But I just wanted to mention it in case you fancy joining. So. Onto the wrap up. Hi everyone, I hope you're having a great start to the week. I'm here today to talk to you about all of the books that, that I read in November. There are 11 of them and all of them will be linked in the description box down below as usual if you'd like to go and find out more. So the first book that I read in November was this one which I'm going to mention briefly because I mentioned it in my Christmas gift guide and I think I've spoken about it elsewhere too basically because I fell in love with it. So this is Remarkable Creatures by Tracy Chevalier. I have read most of Tracy's novels, but I hadn't read one in a while until I read her latest in September, which was a single thread, which is fantastic. It's a novel set in the 1920s about a woman called Violet Speedwell. So because I had just remembered how much I loved her books, I decided to delve into her backlist and I picked up this one, which is set at the beginning of the 19th century and is about Mary Anning, who was a budding paleontologist who discovered lots of fossils on the shores of Lyme Regis, including an ichthyosaur and lots of other creatures. Um, William, oh, Buckland, I forgot his surname there for a second. William Buckland was in this, which was really fun to read about because he's a character who I'm very much interested in. In fact, he's in my short story, Animals, in the beginning of the world, in the middle of the night. Not in person, but he's referenced a lot. He did lots of very bizarre things. So it's about Mary's discoveries and also her relationship with a woman called Elizabeth Philpott, who was also searching for fossils at the same time. This is such a delightful book to cozy up with at this time of year. Also, there is a film coming out next year with uh, Saoirse Ronan and Kate Winslet. I don't think that it's an adaptation of this, which, I may be incorrect about, but from what I've read, I don't think it's an adaptation of this novel, but it is based on both of their lives. So if you would like to read something about them before going to see the film, or if you just want a cozy read for this time of year, then I recommend picking up this one. Reading that one then led me to pick up this because I wanted to read about other women who haven't been discussed much but did amazing things when it comes to the sciences. So this is a century later, this is a non-fiction book and it's called A Lab of One's Own by Patricia Farrer. It's about the suffrage movement and the suffragette movement up to and including the First World War and how during the First World War Millicent Fawcett and others asked for a truce so that everybody could um, work on the home front and it's about what women did on the home front and um, not just on the land which I think is the thing that gets shown the most because that was shown on propaganda posters and indeed in this book uh, Patricia Farrow discusses how those posters which were made to send to the men on the front and to uplift everyone's spirits have been remembered as factual things as opposed to the propaganda posters that they were. So the real lived lives of the women who worked on the land and in factories have been coated over. So women who worked in factories, in the munitions factories and working with TNT, the TNT girls were often called canaries because their skin turned yellow. And working in some of the gas factories as well gave many of the women epilepsy. I would say the main aim of this book is to show the realities and the lived experiences of many different types of women during the war. So lots of differences due to class as well. There were many women who went to work in factories but chose to do that just to enter into the spirit of it. So they chose to work half a day a week, whereas the working class women had 
to work there and then also had to go home and look after their families. So there's also discussions on here about feminists at that time that we remember, such as Virginia Woolf, but how she wasn't really connected to the movements that were going on at the time as well. I reviewed this book in detail for Toast magazine, which I'll link in the description box down below. And if you would like to go over to my review and leave a comment underneath talking about either this book or Tracy Chevalier's books because I spoke about her novels in that post or Persephone books because I spoke about them in that post as well. Just leave us a bookish comment that is telling us about something related to the article and you'll be entered into a giveaway to win a copy of a book that Toast are featuring next month which I think is my year of rest and relaxation by Tissa Moshvet. So yeah, I will link that review down below if you'd like to go read it, find out more and enter that giveaway, which is also open internationally. Speaking of Persephone books, I also read another one of their novels this month. This is Daddy's Gone A-Hunting by Penelope Mortimer. This is slightly different from what I was expecting going by the blurb, but I was delighted uh, in that respect. I would have been happy to have read a book that I thought I was getting, but I was really pleased with the, the direction that this book chose to take as well. This was originally published in the 1950s and then reissued by Persephone Books. And it is about a woman, a housewife who is bored all of her children have been sent back off to school and she's lacking purpose and she feels like she can't really talk about that with anyone that she lives near. It's really very, very real. Think Desperate Housewives, which I know doesn't always <laughs> seem real, but Desperate Housewives, but set in the 1950s. There's definitely elements of that, but it's also talking about really important issues. So in this, Ruth, who is the mother, she's thinking about how she got pregnant when she was young and she had her daughter, Angela, and she loves her daughter very, very much, but that decision whether or not she was gonna have a child was never one that was really given to her. She was always going to have this child. And she loves her daughter, as I said, and her sons. And now her daughter, who is 18, comes to her and is pregnant. And she has to decide whether or not she's going to keep the baby. So it's a book set in the 1950s that talks about abortion and deals a lot with abortion. And it was illegal at the time that this was written. So I think it's, pretty brilliant in that respect and going back to the bit where I was talking about it being like Desperate Housewives let me read you a little quote here that I think is just brilliant it says here the relationships between the men are based on the understanding of success admiration is general affection not uncommon even pity is known the women have no such understanding like little icebergs each keeps a bright and shining face above water Below the surface, submerged in fathoms of leisure, each keeps her own isolated personality. Some are happy, some poisoned with boredom, some drink too much, and some below the demarcation line are slightly crazy. Some love their husbands and some are dying from a lack of love. A few have talent, which is useless to them. I adored this and it's, as well as being about abortion and family, it's really about the misunderstandings between people, the painful misunderstandings, and how we sometimes feel as teenagers that no adults could possibly understand us. And at the same time, we're getting Angela's perspective on that, but the mother who completely understands everything that Angela is going through, but doesn't have the words to express that to her. And that just kind of gets you right here. Next, I read this, which is James Patterson's First to Die. It's the first novel in his Women's Murder Club series. And the reason that I read this was because Penguin got in touch with me and asked if I would like to work with them on the 18th and 19th books in this series over on Instagram. And I said, well, send them to me. And then if I like them, then yes, we can work together. So they sent them to me and I started reading the newest one, 19th Christmas, which you can read as a standalone if you want to, because they give you a recap, plus, you know, crime and Christmas. So if that's your thing, go in straight at number 19. But I'd recently finished reading a crime series and was really looking forward to sinking my teeth into another one. So I said, look, these look great, but I'm gonna go out and buy the first one and read that and let's work together on that instead in the series as a whole. And they said yes to that. Um, this is in no way sponsored. I just did work over on Instagram. I'm just mentioning for context. So I went out and bought this book, which is the first one. It's about a um, homicide detective or a homicide inspector. What's the difference? I should know that. Anyway, a homicide inspector called Lindsay Boxer and the cases that she's working on. In this one, it's about a man who is murdering newly wed couples. And she decides to set up a group with her female friends, one of whom is a journalist, one of whom is a medical examiner. And in this one, the third one is a judge. And they meet at bars and for lunch and they talk about the cases that are going on. This is a very, very fast paced 
crime and you can really picture everything it feels like you're reading a film it's one of those books where the chapters are quite short the last sentence of each chapter makes you want to read the next chapter and it's also just it lands do you know what i mean there's something cutting about it i don't know I really like that. Um, so if you're looking for really fast-paced crime, then I recommend um, giving these a go. I'm going to move on to book two, and I may listen to it on audio because I've heard that the audiobooks are really good. So yes, there's that one. Speaking of crime, I finished reading the Frida Klein series by Nikki French, and honestly, I'm so sad about it. I have loved reading these books. So since we last spoke, since my um, October wrap-up, I have read Friday on my mind, Saturday Requiem, Sunday morning coming down and Day of the Dead. So the last four books in the eight book series and I can't talk about them really because it would spoil the books that have come before it. So I'll just say if you haven't read the series yet then do. The audiobooks are brilliant. They're narrated by someone called Beth Chalmers and I think I enjoyed them all the more for listening to them on audio. So if audio is your thing, then listen to the first one which is called Blue Monday. Um, Frida Klein is a psychotherapist and she loves walking around London um, and finding all the hidden spaces in London, the canals and the rivers, which is something that I love to do myself. So maybe I feel like she's a bit of a kindred spirit in that respect. But you don't just follow her throughout these eight books. You follow her family and her friends and you really get to care about these people. And even though each book is its own case, there is an overall case, which is why you need to read them in order. And the character development is brilliant. I don't know, I just, I loved it. I think these books are gonna make my favorite books of the year, just for like the reading experience alone and the characters made me feel all warm. And when I finished listening to the last book a few days ago, I went straight back to the first book and I'm starting to listen to it again. So I think that's a sign of a really great read. Uh, another non-fiction book that I've started but haven't finished is called At the Pond, Swimming at the Hampstead Ladies Pond. And this is a collection of essays about women who swim at the pond regularly, writers normally who swim there regularly, and why they do it. And um, I am enjoying it, but the ones that I've read so far I have felt have been, not to be punny, but a little surface level, they've been mostly about what the pond is like to swim in and what the water is like and the actual act, you know, where you shower and where you leave your clothes. And that's felt a little bit samey over the pieces that I've read so far. I thought it would be more personal, people's life experiences and why they go there. Um, obviously people have to write about whatever they feel comfortable writing about. Um, but it's just, it's not really what I thought the collection was going to be. But I have quite a few more to read so I'll report back when I finish reading it and I'll tell you whether or not I feel the rest of the book changes um, how I feel about it as a whole but my favourite so far is by Jessica Lee and I've read her book, let me remind myself what it's called because I have forgotten. I've read her book Turning, a swimming memoir which is about wild swimming and I really really love that so I'll link her book down below if you would like to go and check that one out as well as this one obviously um, but by reading the um, bits about the authors at the back I found that she has a new book coming out or has just come out this year it's called Two Trees Make a Forest, a story of memory migration and Taiwan so I'm really grateful to have discovered that she has a new book and I'll definitely go and check that out because as I said her piece so far has been my favourite. Let me see if I can find you a little quote. Oh yeah, here we go. This is her talking about the pond at winter when it freezes over. Brittle as a film of crystals on boiled sugar, the sheet of ice that has encased the pond wilted with the winter rain. I felt like her piece was especially poetic. So yeah, I'll report back once I have finished. Next, I read this book, which is a graphic memoir. So another non-fiction book. This is called A Puff of Smoke by Sarah Lepet. Let me show you the color palette. It's got bright blues, yellows, and pinks. This is about what it's like to grow up with a health condition, especially one that doctors cannot diagnose. So at the age of seven, Sarah started to feel ill. Uh, it turned out that she'd had a stroke, but doctors weren't able to diagnose that through an MRI, so they didn't actually know about that until later. Um, and then she had subsequent problems, she had to have lots of tests, she had lots of infections, doctors put her on lots of different medication which had side effects, she spent a lot of her time in hospital, she experienced paralysis, it was just a very stressful and not very nice time and I think what I really appreciate about this book is that it shows the 
real lived experiences of living with a chronic health condition because I don't think that that's talked about enough and I'm speaking as someone who spent a lot of their childhood in hospital having operations and tests and physio it's really strange that disconnect between that part of your life and then the real because that's how I felt about it part of my life at school whereby my friends wouldn't understand they never saw me in hospital I would just disappear for weeks at a time and um, they didn't come with me to weekly physio appointments where I had to leave school to go to them they didn't understand the tests that I was having and um, Sarah speaks about this in her book when you're in hospital there is always or at least normally always someone who is sicker than you and you can contextualize that when you're there and you're that when you're there you're grateful to not be that ill but then once you leave the bubble of the hospital and you go back to the life that seems to have been on pause while everyone else has been getting on with their life while you have been on pause you don't have that context anymore because you are the ill person so it's um and it's very confusing and exhausting and boring people generally don't want to hear about the boring aspects of having a condition they people have you know a fascination with the gory parts so the operations and the interesting parts not the boring everyday pain and just as i said the endless appointments and the waiting and the fear and the upset we don't talk about that enough and sure it may not be massively exciting but it is important to talk about so i'm very grateful for books like this i would very much recommend this one the only thing i will say is that i thought it ended at a slightly odd place i would have liked maybe a few weeks extra of her life but maybe the point is that it ends quite abruptly like that and you don't get answers um, to some of the things that she has discussed because life is not like that and living with a lifelong health condition means that there are no definite answers and there is no end, you're just constantly living with it. So if that's the reason that it ended like that, then I can live with that and that's absolutely fine. So yeah, I would recommend it. And then finally, the last book that I read is this, which is Snow Garden by Rachel Joyce. This has been sitting on my shelf for a few years now. I think I've read a couple of the stories over the winter months in previous years, but I've always wanted to read it around Christmas and then you know what it's like, you make a TBR, it's gone, suddenly it's the next year and you think, oh, I should keep this for next Christmas. Finally, I have read it at the right time and this was so delightful. Rachel Joyce always gets me. She manages to really strike a balance between humour and pain and the characters always feel so believable that in her books I inevitably will end up crying at one point and in this book it was several points. So this is a collection of short stories, I think there are seven of them and she has an introduction at the beginning which I loved because she said that each of these characters were characters she'd put in novels but were too big to exist inside the novels because they were they were wanting to overtake the story that she was telling to do with the main characters so she had to cut them from those novels and put them in here. These seven stories take place over the last two weeks of the year so you've got Christmas and New Year in here and they're all about family and they're about those awkward conversations at Christmas and performing as yourself in front of people you maybe don't see for a lot of the rest of the year and um, speaking about how artificial some of our Christmases are not to say that this is a book that is really depressing it's not it's just very very real and it's funny in places too but if you've read her novels you know the kind of tone that she strikes so if you've read The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry you will know that one page you will be laughing and then the next page you will be crying sometimes I like to read short stories where things are quite fragmented a hint at and you can't quite glimpse the whole story not that you ever could in a short story but you know what I mean they're, qu they're quite fragmented and you have to piece together a lot of things yourself and speculate as to what's going to happen later and sometimes I like to read short stories where they feel just so beautifully crafted that all of the pieces are there like a jigsaw puzzle and you can stand back and look at everything and feel really really satisfied there are great things to both of those and there are negatives to both of those things too but Rachel's stories fall into the latter category where she manages to make everything feel real there's some very clear metaphors and imagery to help you draw everything together and once you finish a short story you feel extremely satisfied so if that's the kind of short story that you like to read then I would recommend I, I would especially recommend it for people who don't read short stories that often because 
these are less experimental and I think you would really enjoy them. But I honestly would recommend this to everybody and I think you should curl up with it at this time of year. It will make you feel happy and sad and warm and cozy and all of those things. So those are all the books that I read in November. As I said, I'll link all of them in the description box down below. Let me know what you've been reading recently in a comment down below. I hope you guys are having a great month. If you would like to join me for Vlogmas, you can do. If not, I'll be back in a few days on here. Lots of bookish love. Bye.